Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. The fascination with violence has been a perplexing fact of human nature throughout history, posing questions about the dark corners of our psyches and the complex interplay of biology, culture and psychology. It is a phenomenon that transcends time and borders, manifesting in various forms, from ancient gladiator spectacles and medieval public executions, to modern day violent video games and graphic films. At the core of our fascination with violence lies a complex set of psychological factors. One prevailing theory suggests that humans are drawn to violence because it offers a form of catharsis. Observing or engaging in violent acts can provide an outlet for suppressed emotions like anger, frustration or fear. It offers a controlled environment where individuals can release pent up feelings and temporarily alleviate psychological stress. Human beings possess an innate curiosity about the unknown and the forbidden. Violence, often regarded as a taboo subject, triggers morbid curiosity. People are naturally drawn into it because it represents a realm that they may never experience personally, but are nonetheless intrigued by. Imagine the scenario where you are driving to work, just like any other Monday, and you see ahead that there has been a terrible car crash. When you drive past the scene of the accident, most of our inclinations would lead us to slow down and take a peek at the destruction. The thrill of adrenaline is another potent psychological factor. Violence, whether witnessed or participated in, triggers the body's flight or fight response, leading to a surge of adrenaline. This intense sensation can be highly addictive, compelling some individuals to seek out violent activities or media. Ultimately, throughout human history, exposure to violence has been a constant theme throughout our existence. From the days of the Colosseum, watching man vs beast fight to the death, to today, where extremely gruesome content is available at the click of a button, not just on low rent virus infected gore sites, but even mainstream social media networks. Arguably, in 2023, the ease of access to such content containing unimaginable barbarism may have desensitized a whole generation. Although most of us rarely see such brutality in the flesh, I would argue that possibly at no point in recent human history have we had such ease of access to this type of real violence media. In recent times, fascination has only grown in relation to the war on drugs, particularly among Mexican drug cartels. TV shows such as Narcos, as well as various online documentaries, has only furthered people's curiosity into narco lore. With the rising interest in the topic, one subtopic that has been further highlighted is the tactic of weaponized violence by drug cartels. This has arguably become the calling card among Mexican drug gangs, and the rise of social media has only exasperated this phenomenon. When you ask someone, what is the first thought that comes to your mind when I say Mexican drug cartels? Many will point to a scene of a poor soul, gagged and bound, surrounded by devilish individuals, before being brutally excised from this plane of existence. However, drug cartels in Mexico are not the only ones to utilize this savage tactic of terror. Criminal factions in Brazil have also adopted the same tactic in their pursuit of power, control and territory. Though, such videos from Brazil tend not to attract as much attention in comparison to videos coming out of Mexico, despite them being every bit as brutal. Brazil, 
known for its breathtaking locations and vibrant culture, also grapples with a darker side, drug gangs, primarily known as factions. These criminal organisations have plagued the country for decades, inflicting violence, instability and social decay. Brazil's struggle with drug gangs can be traced back to the late 20th century. During this time, drug trafficking and gang violence began to rise, primarily in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. The roots of this issue can be attributed to various factors, including poverty and government corruption. Brazil's drug gangs are typically organised into hierarchical structures with clear divisions of labour and responsibilities. At the top are powerful drug lords who control vast territories and oversee the drug trade. They are often backed by heavily armed militias and have a network of foot soldiers to enforce their rule and protect their interests. The foot soldiers, or soldados, are the visible face of these gangs. They are primarily responsible for street-level drug distribution, extortion and violent activities. In some cases, children and teenagers are forcibly recruited into these roles, further perpetrating the cycle of violence and crime. Brazilian drug gangs very frequently employ women, very often giving them a position known as mulas, to transport drugs, weapons or money. These women are often exploited and subjected to harsh living conditions. The presence of drug gangs has a devastating impact on Brazilian society. Violence is a constant threat in many neighbourhoods, with territorial disputes and police confrontations leading to frequent shootouts and civilian casualties. The drug trade fuels an illicit economy that further destabilises communities, making it difficult for residents to live normal lives. One of the most insidious effects of drug gangs is the recruitment of young people into a life of crime. Children and teenagers facing limited educational opportunities and economic prospects are drawn into these gangs as a means of survival. This not only perpetrates the cycle of violence, but also robs Brazil of its future potential. Arguably, the two biggest drug factions in Brazil are Comando Primero de Capital, or in English, First Command of the Capital, and Comando Vermelho, or in English, the Red Command. Both gangs have become renowned for their sophisticated recruitment techniques, severe hyperviolence, and recorded executions. Drug factions in Brazil have the same ambitions as their counterparts in Mexico, however, the formation of such gangs is very different in comparison to Mexico. In Brazil, many of the most powerful and prominent factions never even started as drug gangs. Instead, they started as prison protest movements. Primero Comando de Capital formed in 1993, and Comando Vermelho formed in 1979. Both formed as prison protest groups, complaining about the inhumane conditions in which inmates were being held, as well as the brutality inflicted upon them by prison guards. Commando Vermelo in particular also had a political angle to the movement. They formed out of a prison alliance between common criminals and leftist guerrillas, who were imprisoned together at Candido Mendes, a maximum security prison on the island of Ila Grande. In 1979, prison officials labelled the alliance Commando Vermelho, a name which the prisoners eventually co-opted as their own. The prisoners formed the alliance to protect themselves from prison violence and guard inflicted brutality. As the group coalesced, the common criminals were infused with leftist social justice ideals by the guerrillas. However, as the years passed, both Commando Vermelho and Primero Commando de Capital moved away from being protest or political groups 
into becoming full-blown criminal organisations. In the 1980s, Commando Vermelo expanded beyond Ilo Grande into other prisons and the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, and became involved in the rapidly growing cocaine industry. Meanwhile, Brazil's shift towards democracy and the eventual end of a military dictatorship in 1985 allowed the leftist guerrillas to re-enter society. Thus, Commando Vermelo largely abandoned its left-wing ideology. Primero Commando de Capital, which was also formally referred to as the Party of Crime, was founded with a clear agenda to fight the oppression inside the Sao Paulo penitentiary system, and to avenge the death of 111 prisoners, victims of the October 2nd 1992 Carindiru massacre, when the Sao Paulo State Military Police stormed the now defunct Casa de Detenção and killed the prisoners from the Ninth Pavilion in the process. The group made the Chinese yin yang symbol as their emblem, saying it represented a way to balance good and evil with wisdom. In February of 2001, Idemir Sombra Carlos Ambrosio became the most prominent leader of the organization when he coordinated, by cell phone, simultaneous rebellions in 29 Sao Paulo state prisons, in which 16 prisoners were killed. Sombra, also referred to as Father, was eventually beaten to death in prison five months later by five members of a criminal faction in an internal struggle for the general command of Primero Commando de Capital. The PCC was then led by two men who went by the aliases Geliao and Cecenia, responsible for the alliance with another criminal organization, Rio de Janeiro's Commando Vermelo. Following the alliance with CV, the gang adopted Vermelo's far left beliefs and began advocating for revolution and the destruction of Brazil's capitalist system. Both Commando Vermelo and Primero Commando de Capital worked together effectively for nearly 20 years. However, the truce between the two organisations was broken in 2016, resulting in an all-out war between the two organisations. Truth be told, their partnership started going sour in 2015 after the PCC encroached on Familia do Norte's territory, Familia do Norte being Commando Vermelo's allies. In retaliation, three top PCC leaders were murdered at Manaus Prison in the summer of 2015, and another 38 PCC members were killed outside Manaus Prison walls between June and July of that year. It was a show of force from the Commando Vermelo Familia do Norte alliance to remind their rivals that trying to steal their territory would be met with extreme measures. The next 12 months or so passed by quietly, with no retaliation from Primero Commando de Capital, but in October of 2016, PCC decided to end its long-standing relationship abruptly with Commando Vermelo, accusing the gang of siding with rival groups, including Familia do Norte. That decision triggered a wave of riots, stabbings and executions, and by the end of that month, 20 people were dead in three penitentiaries across the country's rural north. Authorities blamed the PCC for the killings in the states of Rondonia and Roraima, and concluded that Commando Vermelo was responsible for an attack in the state of Acre, along with 11 more who were executed there outside the prison walls. Ever since 2016, the two gangs have been in a tit-for-tat war for control, with both sides losing members in ever more gruesome ways. As of right now, it is Primero Commando de Capital who are seen as the biggest drug gang in Brazil, and they have the advantage over Commando Vermelo due to having more influence, members and resources, as well as being a better organised gang, with connects all over the world, aiding their drug trafficking operations. 
It said that the group have ties to Colombia, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay and Venezuela in South America alone, as well as having links to organised crime groups in the USA. PCC also have various connections in Europe, most notably with the Andrangheta, a prominent Italian mafia type organised crime syndicate based in the peninsular region of Calabria in Italy. The Andrangheta is considered one of the most powerful organised crime groups in the world. In 2007, Italian anti-organised crime agencies estimated that the Andrangheta has an annual revenue of about 35 to 40 billion dollars, which amounts to approximately 3.5% of the entire GDP of Italy. This mostly comes from illegal drug trafficking, but also from ostensibly legal businesses such as construction, restaurants and supermarkets. Links between PCC and Andrangheta have been exposed for several years. A marriage of convenience between the Andrangheta and the PCC emerged to smuggle drugs from Brazil to Europe. Each group controls one side of the cocaine flow, posing no risk to the other. While both groups have other sources of revenue, this transnational pipeline has played an important role in each group's success and expansion. Over the last few years, the PCC has grown dramatically, giving them the advantage over their rivals Commando Vermelo as well as other groups. In recent years, much of the gang violence in Brazil has been a result of the war between PCC and CV. Much like Mexican drug cartels, Brazilian drug factions utilise the terror tactic of filmed executions. However, such videos, despite their incredible levels of brutality, do not draw as much attention online as executions filmed and uploaded by Mexican drug cartels. The videos are filmed for the exact same reasons as those in Mexico, purely for terror, propaganda, and to scare rivals and anyone who dares go against their group. Very often, videos are initially shared on social media sites and apps such as Twitter, Facebook and even Snapchat, and they are only shared further from there. Unfortunately, these videos are not covered in the same way as those filmed by well-known drug cartels in Mexico, which makes researching these cases incredibly difficult which is why I haven't covered as many cases from Brazil as maybe I could have. But make no mistake, they are every bit as brutal as the well-known cartel videos that you are all aware of. I'd like to thank a subscriber who prefers not to be named for recommending this particular case. Considering its brutality and sadistic nature, I'm surprised this case hasn't been mentioned long before now. But nevertheless, what happens in the actual video? In relation to when the video first surfaced online, I cannot find any specific date or time, though the subscriber who recommended the case seemed to think that the video made its way online during 2020 or 2021. According to several rumours, the victim in the video is likely a suspected member of Commando Vermelo, which makes it very likely that the killer belongs to their rivals, Primero Commando de Capital. The video itself is 2 minutes and 11 seconds in length, and it was shot during the daytime in a forest or jungle type location. As you play the video, the opening few seconds shows a POV style shot of someone aiming a pistol at the victim's head as he sits on the ground. The victim is wearing jeans with a red tank top and appears to be in his 20s. He doesn't have his hands tied and is not bound. The victim briefly reads out a statement and it sounds as if he mentions Commando Vermelo. At 9 seconds into the video, it jump cuts and then shows the victim digging a hole with a gardening tool. He is digging his final resting place. 
Once again, you see the person filming holding a pistol and aiming at the victim. At around 15 seconds into the video, once again it jump cuts, this time showing the victim laying on his back in the freshly dug shallow grave. The victim has his arms resting on his chest as he braces for the worst. A man then enters shot. He is wearing a black hoodie and a snapback. The hoodie is tight over his head, which conceals a lot of his face. He also uses his left hand to hide his face. He is holding a machete in his right hand, and as the victim is laying in the grave, he strikes him several times with a blade on the back of his neck, which causes the victim to let out terrifying groans. The victim isn't tied up or bound, and he tries to protect himself. He puts his hands up and tries to protect himself, as he groans in agony. The killer then starts to use the machete in a stabbing type motion, stabbing the side of the victim's neck, which causes horrible intermittent gurgling and heaving type sounds. The hitman then starts to stab the top of the victim's chest and the front of his neck, once again causing horrible groaning sounds which change in pitch as he is being stabbed. The victim rolls over to his side and uses his hands and arms to cover his neck and head. The killer then starts to maniacally hack away, aiming for the victim's head, but ends up hitting his arms and hands, causing deep lacerations. The attack at this point is frenzied. He then starts to strike the victim repeatedly on the back of his neck, which he can't protect, which creates horrible thudding sounds as blade hits bone. The machete is blunt, and it is causing the victim's ordeal to be dragged out and prolonged. At this point in the video, a man with a deep voice can be heard shouting in the background. I don't think it's the killer or the cameraman, but someone else off camera. It sounds like he mocks the victim by letting out a deep groaning scream, mimicking the victim. The killer continues to hack, stab, and slash away at the victim as he still tries to protect himself. His arms, neck, chest, and hands are covered in deep lacerations at this point, and he is drenched in blood. At around 1 minute and 38 seconds into the video, it jump cuts again, this time showing a close-up of the victim, who is now dead at this point, nearly completely decapitated. The person filming is now using the flash on his phone. It appears to be getting darker. The victim's head is only held onto his body by a few strands of flesh and skin. You see the hitman cut through the remaining pieces of flesh with the machete, and this segment of the video really highlights how blunt the blade is. Even cutting through thin strands of skin seems to be hard for the killer, which puts it into perspective on how long the victim was likely alive during his ordeal. The killer then finally completes the beheading, as you hear him pant and breathe heavily in the background. The nature of the video is very disturbing, due to how maniacal and frenzied the murder was. The killer didn't rely on precision, and didn't care for efficiency. He just continued to hack away with the blunt machete. The sounds of the clip are also emotionally jarring, and horrible to listen to. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. Certainly one of the lesser known cases I've covered in recent times surrounding organised crime, but the video itself is incredibly brutal. But as I mentioned earlier, these cases from Brazil tend not to get highlighted, but the sad reality is there are so many of these videos from Brazil out there. I mean, there's a whole host of others I could cover, and I mean some really nasty cases. But yeah, anyway, as always guys, thank you for the support, it's much appreciated. If you could check out the links in the pinned comments, you can follow me on Twitter, and if you have any case ideas, you can DM me. Also, if you could follow me on Twitch as well, uh, we recently hit 2,000 followers on Twitch, which was nice. Uh, that's a place where we let our hair down, have fun, 
We don't really talk about things like this on Twitch. We we just have fun, really, you know? It's kind of a different community to what is on this channel, so check it out if that interests you. But anyway, as always, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.